Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening, welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Uzma Jafri. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you. India's Jammu and Kashmir sees twin blast attacks within eight hours, two injured. Pakistani NGO brings classroom to children at flood relief camp. And Russia and China call on United States to release frozen Afghan assets. And now for all the details. Two blasts inside parked buses within hours left two civilians injured in Udhampur in India's Jammu and Kashmir territory on Thursday. In March this year, one civilian was killed and 17 others injured in a similar blast in Udhampur. Two consecutive blasts hit India's Jammu and Kashmir within a span of eight hours, injuring two people and damaging vehicles. The first blast took place on Wednesday at Dumail Chowk in Udhampur around 10.30 p.m. local time and was followed by another on Thursday at around 6 a.m. in the city's old bus stand along the road leading to Udhampur to Ramnagar. Earlier in March, Udhampur fell prey to a similar blast which led to the death of one civilian and caused injuries to 17 people owing to the plantation of a sticky bomb. धमाका तो जोरदार था ही आप देखिए इसमें जो है दो बंदे इंजर्ड भी हुए हैं और साथ में जो गाड़ियां और भी यहां पर खड़ी हैं एक दो गाड़ियां उनको भी डैमेज हुआ है पर ये आगे जो है इसका जो है नेचर ऑफ ब्लास्ट क्या है किस तरह का है ये जो है पूरा इन्वेस्टिगेशन के बाद हम आपको बता पाएंगे उधमपुर काउंसलर फ्रॉम द कांग्रेस पार्टी अलोंग विद सम लोकल्स हेल्ड अ प्रोटेस्ट ओवर सिक्योरिटी लैप्स व्हाइल आल्सो रेजिंग एंटी पाकिस्तान स्लोगन्स शी सेड दिस इज अ ब्लॉट ऑन आवर रीजन सिक्योरिटी the peaceful residents have been terrorized. बिल्कुल प्रोटेस्ट इसलिए कह रहे हैं कि तीन महीने पहले भी ये हुआ था तब भी कोई किसी को होश नहीं आई कल भी हुआ रात को उसके बाद भी कोई होश नहीं आई आज फिर हुआ तो ये हमारे शहर की सुरक्षा का बिल्कुल एक सेंध लगी है बुरी तरह और जो लोग पीसफुली रह रहे थे उनको एक तरीके से दहशत दी गई है a team of the National Investigation Agency also reached Udhampur, while the Army Bomb Disposal Squad conducted a probe at the site. India has long accused Pakistan AIDS terror groups to spread unrest in Kashmir Valley. Islamabad, however, denies the allegations. India's top court on Thursday upheld the right of a woman to an abortion up to 24 weeks into pregnancy regardless of marital status, a decision which has been widely hailed by women's rights activists. The court added that every woman should have the reproductive autonomy to seek abortion without consulting a third party. India's Supreme Court on Thursday upheld the right of a woman to an abortion up to 24 weeks into pregnancy regardless of her marital status, a decision which was widely hailed by women's rights activists. The right to abortion has proved contentious globally after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned in June its landmark 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade that had legalized the procedure across the United States. The Apex Court in India also said that the law cannot be static and should be evolved with changing times, adding that non-traditional relationships, like live-in, should be recognized under the law. It added that every woman should have the reproductive autonomy to seek abortion without consulting a third party. The court further added that sexual assault by husbands can be classified as marital rape under medical termination of pregnancy law. Indian law does not consider marital rape an offence, though efforts are being made to change this. One of the most progressive judgments coming from the Supreme Court, absolutely respecting the rights and the choice of women. Not telling women that their social status of being married or unmarried affects their decisions and right to have an abortion or not. 
And here, in this particular judgment, it is very clear that marital rape is considered a crime. The decision came in response to a petition by a 25-year-old woman who said her pregnancy resulted from a consensual relationship, but she had sought abortion when the relationship failed. Earlier, the law allowed abortion up to 24 weeks for special categories of women, including survivors of rape, victims of incest and other vulnerable women. In news from Pakistan, Pakistan's ruling PMLN party Vice President Maryam Nawaz has said former Prime Minister Imran Khan must be taught a lesson after a controversial audio leak between him and his principal secretary about the US conspiracy surfaced on Wednesday. Khan has repeatedly demanded snap elections, blaming he was ousted as Prime Minister in a US-led conspiracy that toppled his government in April. Pakistan's ruling PMLN party Vice President Maryam Nawaz lashed out at opposition PTI Chairman Imran Khan after a controversial audio leak between Khan and his principal secretary about the US conspiracy surfaced on Wednesday. In the clip, Khan reportedly said that they should play with the cipher issue. The clip went viral on the internet three days after the release of audio leaks involving Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif and others, which the Premier has termed serious security labs. Maryam in a series of tweets said that it doesn't hurt to know that foreign-trained and funded chaos mongers tried to jeopardize the fate of the country because that's exactly what they were supposed to do as they have been paid millions of dollars to spread anarchy in the country. She added, Traitor Imran must be taught a lesson. Interior Minister Rana Sanaullah said the leak had laid bare Imran's entire narrative of foreign conspiracy and accused the former Premier of dividing the nation. Meanwhile, reports suggest that Imran Khan has said that it is good that the audio got leaked and added that Cypher should also get leaked so that everybody comes to know how big the foreign conspiracy was. It is pertinent to mention that Imran Khan has repeatedly mentioned a US conspiracy toppled his PTI-led government. He has been demanding snap elections since his ouster in April. More on news from Pakistan. Hundreds of thousands of flood-displaced people in Pakistan have for weeks been living in the open or in makeshift camps facing lack of food and water. A local NGO in a bid to provide education to the children in such camps has set up a temporary school to bring the classroom for them in Balochistan province. Parents have lauded the effort and said they were earlier worried as the calamity had disrupted education of their children. Amid devastating floods in Pakistan, hundreds of thousands of flood-displaced people have for weeks been living either in the open or in a decrepit camps. A local NGO Al Khidmat Pakistan Foundation has set up a temporary school to bring the classroom to the children living in camps in Quetta city in Balochistan province. Dozens of children were heard reciting out loud lessons in the classroom under a tent at the relief camp. Parents have lauded the effort and said they were earlier worried as the calamity had disrupted education of their children. Devastating floods in the recent months have engulfed large swaths of the country and killed nearly 1,600 people. The Pakistani government and the UN both have blamed the flooding on climate change. Authorities say the stagnant flood waters spread over hundreds of miles may take two to six months to recede. पढ़ाई के लिए भी परेशान था उधर कुछ नहीं था उधर सारा पानी था इधर अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह पढ़ाई के लिए भी अच्छी है सारे रहने के लिए भी अच्छी है Earlier this month the National Disaster Agency said that about 637000 displaced people were being housed in tent villages adding that the raging waters had swept away 1.6 million houses over 5700 miles of roads and railways and inundated over 2 million acres of farmland Moving on, Junaid Qureshi, a Kashmiri activist, raised at the UNHRC session in Geneva this week the issue of Islamabad's repeated attempts to change the constitutional status of Pakistan-administered Kashmir. He said that Pakistan wants to change the demography of the illegally occupied region while it has continued to deny rights to the local residents. 
Junaid Qureshi, a Kashmiri activist, phrased at UNHRC the issue of Islamabad's repeated attempts to change the status of Pakistan-administered Kashmir by amending the 1974 interim constitution. Qureshi, who is also the director of Brussels-based European Foundation for South Asian Studies, EFSAS, noted that amid massive protests by locals and activists, the proposed 15th constitutional amendment was withdrawn. Critics strongly objected to the government's plan to alter the region's constitutional status and snatch rights of the locals as it would have deemed the hold of Kashmiri political parties as anti-democratic. Qureshi urged the UN Council to prevent Pakistan from carrying out any such changes in future. This amendment represented the 24th Pakistani attempt to determine the constitutional status of this forcibly held part of Jammu and Kashmir, while the huge protest eventually resulted in the withdrawal of the proposed amendment. Pakistan's repeated attempts to alter the status of territory that it holds illegally renders the prospects of a fair and respectable solution to the issue of Jammu and Kashmir extremely murky and complicated. Mr. Vice President, it is therefore imperative that this council uses all the tools at its disposal to prevent Pakistan from carrying out any changes to the status of Pakistan-administered Jammu and Kashmir. Locals blame Pakistan has misruled the region for more than seven decades. They claim they are not even consulted when Islamabad brings about such legislations and they are subject to brute force whenever they express. They say there is a stooge government in the region, but it only helps Islamabad fill its treasuries through economic depredations. Russian and Chinese diplomats at a meeting of the UN Security Council this week called on the United States to release Afghanistan's financial assets, seized and frozen after the Taliban took over the country last year. Washington earlier this month said about 3.5 billion US dollars in Afghan central bank assets will be transferred into a new Swiss-based trust fund that will be shielded from the Taliban. The envoys of Russia and China at a meeting of the United Nations Security Council this week called on the U.S. to release Afghanistan's financial assets, seized and frozen after the Taliban took over the country last year. The U.S. Treasury Department earlier this month said about 3.5 billion U.S. dollars in Afghan central bank assets will be transferred into a new Swiss-based trust fund that will be shielded from the Taliban. It said the funds will be used to help stabilize Afghanistan's collapsed economy. However, the move has been met with widespread condemnation from Afghans who have blamed Washington for the ongoing humanitarian and economic crisis as it has withheld Afghan assets for so long. Noting the recent developments and the statement of the Central Bank of Afghanistan, we call for the full return the full and swift return of these frozen assets to the Afghan people as early as possible so that they can be effectively used to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and the humanitarian suffering of the Afghan people. The Taliban-run government in Afghanistan has termed the U.S. move against the international norms and said if the reserves are disbursed without taking consideration the inputs by Afghanistan, the Islamic Emirate will be forced to impose fines and ban on such illegal activities. Bangladesh is celebrating the World Tourism Day this week with various events including colourful rallies in parts of the country. A week-long beach carnival has also been organised to attract tourists to the world's longest beach in Cox's Bazaar district. Bangladesh is celebrating the World Tourism Day this week with various events organized in parts of the country. A colorful rally was taken out in the capital Dhaka to mark the annual event on Tuesday. The United Nations World Tourism Organization has celebrated World Tourism Day on September 27 since the 1980s. This year's global theme for the occasion is Rethinking Tourism, focusing on the sector's impact on the planet and opportunities to grow more sustainably. Bangladesh State Minister for Tourism Mohammad Mehboob Ali, among others, joined the rally in Dhaka, which showcased the rich culture and heritage of the South Asian nation. Hundreds of hotels and tourist spots in the country also offered special discounts on the occasion. 
As part of the festivities, a week-long beach carnival has also been organized to attract tourists to the world's longest beach in Cox Bazar district, some 400 kilometers southeast of Dhaka. Bangladesh from Tuesday onwards also lifted restrictions imposed due to COVID-19 foreign tourists willing to enter the country. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India.